Thank everybody for coming. Um, as you know, this talk is going to be about continuous integration for Android. So here came the first question. How many people here in this room is actually using continuous integration or have heard about continuous integration? OK. That's a good amount of people. I still think I'm going to show you a few things you haven't uh, seen before um, with Android, Jenkins, and, and Gradle that you can do to improve your process. Um, this is going to be the agenda for today. Um, as you know, continuous integration is a topic that uh, comprises many different other areas. Um, so I'm trying, I tried to summarize a little bit everything here. I will give a short introduction. I will talk and, and show you about Jenkins uh, as a continuous integration platform. I will show you a practical example on how to have an Android application that is being developed and is being um, built and delivered on real time. I will talk about Gradle. I will show you a little bit how Gradle works, how can we use flavors, how can we use the build types to create new applications. I will talk about a topic that is, I haven't seen that in many conferences or in many talks, but I think it's really important when you are working in a, either by in a startup or in a big company, which is the branching strategies and how to, how to adopt a strategy to work efficiently with teams and with different applications. I will talk about testing, a super important part that could take just like a few talks talking about um, user interface testing or integration testing and, and everything. I just want to give you a little, a little taste about it. And then, yeah, first my um, Diego slide. I think it's appropriate to call it like this. My name is Enrique Lopez Mañas. I'm from um, Spain originally. I live in Germany. This is my Twitter and my G+, if you want to follow me or to ask me anything about the talk. And I'm a mobile developer in Munich. I'm part of the Google Developer Expert program for, uh, for Android. Continuous integration. When we talk about continuous integration, we meet continuous merging. The different branches should be merging with each other. It's about continuous testing. We do not especially, we do not need a team of dedicated people testing the applications. We want to trust the machine to do this. There is a continuous building of the application. We are delivering and building the application several times a day with its, uh, with its uh, new feature, with its commit we are doing. And there is an important work when we talk about continuous integration, which is automatization. As a general rule, machines are better than humans to when it comes to make mistakes. They don't make any mistakes, and we human do. I will say it again. Machines are always working flawless without any mistake or any error. If you don't believe me, just watch Terminator. So they win because the machines are much better. Actually, I think that Terminator started because Skynet took control over Jenkins, and everything started with Jenkins. Um, yeah, so what do you need uh, when you're going to start uh, implementing a continuous integration process? You need Jenkins or uh, another continuous integration engine. So I'm using Jenkins because it's open source. I, I really like it. I think it's very powerful. But you also have Travis. You have proprietary solutions from Atlassian, like Bamboo. Um, you need a build system or a build mechanism. I'm, I'm giving an example with Android. I'm therefore using Gradle. But as you probably know, Android is working with Maven as well. How many people knows Maven or have experience here? OK. Yeah. So Gradle is like the expansion. It's a little bit more powerful than, than Maven. And the good thing is that it's totally specialized in Android. So we, can, uh, we have methods to access, access the manifest, to perform tests with, uh, with Espresso, with, uh, with GUnit, et cetera. We need, of course, our repository with the, the application or the product we are being developing. And we need a merging strategy. We need to, to establish how are we going to be working within a team, how we will be releasing our application, et cetera. Uh, yeah, Jenkins, as I said, is the, it's pretty much in numbers, the leading continuous integration server. It's open source, it's based in Java, and it has a super powerful plugin system. That means if there is a new technology, very likely, um, plugin will arise from the community, and we can also develop our own plugins. It looks like this. I will show you later an, an, uh, how, um, a real example of my computer, but pretty much we have a, a lot of jobs here. Each job is, uh, let's going to think as a, of a product or a, a job generates always an output. It will generate an APK. If we are integrating continuous integration with the backend, it will deploy on one of our servers, etc. We have a few more information sections here like um, uh, the build processor status, if we have like different um, processors working in parallel, if we have like builds that are planned to be done in the future, etc. 
Um, yeah, as I said, the, the plugin system is really powerful. We have plugins for, for Android, for Git. We have a super cool plugin that allows us, allows Jenkins to see if something has been pushed to, to Git and uh, automatically start the, the build of the application without having to, to pull continuously GitHub. We have plugins for Bitbucket, for emulators, for Genymotion. It's, it's a really cool uh, biosphere of software. The branching strategy, for me, this is one of my favorite points and I think it's really important. Not many people think about that when I'm, I'm at the moment uh, freelancing and when I, I talk with some companies and I mention the, the branching strategy, some of them is like, yeah, we commit when we're finished. That's not a branching strategy. A branching strategy is about separating the different products and the different phases of our software. There is a very cool model. I have modified a little bit, but um, you can get the original one of these websites. So this, this guy created like a, a lot of uh, uh, diagrams explaining how he's separating his software and, and uh, etc. I, I have added a few things that I would like to explain just a proposal, but this is a little bit like um, uh, like the agile processes. This is not a Bible. This is not a something you have to follow as it is. You have to think how this adapts to your organization and your needs and change it accord accordingly. It's not the same to work in a company of 1,000 employees where you have to work within teams when you're in a startup is different because maybe you're just a few people working in IT. So this needs to be adapted to the your environment. Um, how many people here um, branches when it's working with the application. That means you're using like develop, uh, probably the alpha, master. Okay, that's not that much. So uh, yeah, when we are working, we want to keep an status of the application when it's being developed, when it's being tested, and when it's being released. So you can know uh, uh, in which status uh, uh, each branch uh, corresponds with. It's easier to solve bugs, it's easy, easier to keep a group of people working and committing to the same brands. So in this case, I'm, I'm gonna make this proposal, which is the standard, the uh, fact proposal. The master brands stands for everything that has been released. When the software is released, it's commit to, brand, to master, and we create a version there, a tag, to say like, this is a version 1.1 of our uh, production environment. We can see it here. Uh, when we are developing a new feature, as we see, we branch into develop, each of those points represent a commit, uh, like login screen, test for login, um, refactor, stabilization, etc. When we have a new production release, as we can see here, this is merged again into master, and the process starts again. We can keep on developing, merging into master. As a rule, uh, many people doesn't does it either, but um, how many people work with uh, pull requests and code reviews here? Okay. Those who haven't is an amazing tool to ensure that code is working. That means pretty much if the developer A is uh, creating something, developing some tickets or some features, before he can merge the code into master, he needs to open a pull request. Traditionally, one or two people will take care of this pull request. These people will check the code, they will download, they will ensure that it's working in a different environment. So we get rid of many of those problems, like it was working or it was compiling of my, on my computer. By doing code reviews, we ensure that, okay, now we are gonna try three, four different computers. Um, when we are developing, it happens very often that uh, um, we are not intentionally doing this, but we know where the software is not that good. So we avoid to test this part. We know it's, uh, it has been done very fast and it's not that well done or it's not probably tested. So we just uh, try not to think a lot about that, but when there is more people doing these peer, peer reviews, we ensure that the code really gets very, it, the quality goes really high and we can prevent a lot of codes, bugs that are sometimes obvious, but we've been pro, uh, programming for eight hours, so we are not aware of them. And um, yeah, uh, when we are developing new features, we, as we see here, we have a master, we have a develop. Now there is one more branch, which is called the feature branch. So every time we are uh, creating a new feature, we will branch for de from develop, keep on working, and the process goes uh, again, uh, bringing the feature back into develop. Um, yeah, I want to show you also two examples of merge. So when you're gonna merge from one uh, branch into the other, we have um, two options that I, I think are, um, yeah. Um, different, some of them have advantages and uh, disadvantages. If we merge with a uh, uh, minus minus no FF, um, 
we will keep a track of the feature branches. So that makes it also easier to track the, the code. When we see the entire tree of features, we can see like, okay, this came from a feature, this has been done in this branch. The, the code has been evolving like this. If we use the git merge, the plain one, uh, it will be a little bit cleaner when we, uh, when we see the final, the final tree, but it's also a little bit hard to see how the software evolved. So that's why I like a lot when I'm doing a commit, I write between brackets uh, the Jira uh, ticket, for example, or um, I have a, f a few codes, like if I'm making a fix, I will just write fix between brackets or new feature or refactoring so I can like track very easily what has been done. And then this comes again into play because with um, Jenkins, we can automatize all those things to make release notes. Okay, I'm gonna show you a few, um, some example of how we will be working. Um, traditionally, you probably work with uh, some agile methodology. Let's gonna call it a Scrum or a Kanban or a combination of both. Each uh, blue line here represents a sprint. Um, as I like to work, uh, it's uh, with kind of an agile process between um, Scrum and Canvas. Let's gonna think of this first iteration as the development week or the development sprint. The second one, the stabilization, where we proceed to refactoring and fixing the things we haven't done, making the test coverage, etc. We will start with our, our application in uh, master, so this is our starting point, right? And we will branch into alpha or develop, depends a little bit of the naming policy you like. And this will be our version 1.0.1. So we see that we develop a feature, we make a pull request into alpha again, 1.02. These numbers will be automated later with, uh, with Jenkins and Gradle. We make another feature, we make another pull request, it's commit again, 1.03. And at the end of the, the development week, this is uh, merged into beta or states. That means we are creating our beta candidate or our release candidate. During this uh, stabilization week, as you see here, we have a bug. This is not a feature anymore. anymore. We uh, start solving bugs and solving problems. Uh, in this week, I also like to write the test because uh, yeah, you have more time and you can really focus on not making the test fast, but like making a proper planning. I will make a full test coverage for the uh, login uh, module or whatever we want. And when this is finished, we make a merge into master. That means we have uh, um, approved the application, the application has been published or submit to the, to the store or whatever, and we have the final version, 1.08. Uh, we have hot, hot fixes, right? That's a bug that hasn't been found in the stabilization week, so we need to uh, it, uh, fix them when they, the application is already published. That's a bad situation, but it happens. So in this case, we um, since we know this is happening in the, mas in the version in master, in the release version, we will branch from this version. We can see here this, uh, this branch hotfix that gets merged again into, into master. And here, as we see, we can keep on uh, developing. So the, those weeks are like overlapped. We work on uh, one week on feature development that gets stabilized during the stabilization. We can keep on developing. But there is a flaw here. Does anybody see it? Yeah, that's good. Maybe you get the book. Yeah, so uh, we've done the hotfix here, right? But the hotfix doesn't go back to uh, to beta or alpha, so if we keep on developing, the bug is still there. That's important, when we are making a hotfix, it needs to be merged into master, into beta, and into alpha. So we make sure the bug is, uh, is not working in, in any of the, of the branches. Yeah, we have here the, the explanation a little bit more detail. We have our tagging master, we have found the bug, the bug is solved, and then it's merged into all the, all the branches that, uh, that apply. And uh, yeah, here we can uh, see the example a little bit more expanded. Well, uh, this is more about hot fixing. So as we see, we have here our, our features. They keep developing. In this, uh, at this point, we are with the version 1.8, 1.7. So this is the, the, the version from the previous week. The, you, of course, have to adopt the, the numbering uh, politic you like. I like to use this one. So each week or each sprint is a x dot, uh, dot x, so it's like the second number is getting increased. And um, yeah, the, f the first number is all only when there is like a major release, but this makes very easy to track all the versions. You can um, go back to the to the, the version that has any bugs if you need to solve them. Uh, are you by the way familiar with tags? Uh, 
in uh, GitHub, anybody knows them? Yeah. So tags are really cool because if, uh, if you know that the, the, the bug happens in a particular version, if you have a tag, you can uh, check out this thing entirely from GitHub or your repository and you can exactly attack the, the version that is presenting the bug. So you don't have to worry if a feature, a feature that was developed later, it's uh, modified this bug or is creating new bugs or, or anything. So yeah, this is an, an example in this section from here. I will expand it a little bit more on how the hot fixes are done. So we, in this branch from here, we are, is, we are always developing the fixing the bugs. This alpha branch is the one that uh, is creating the new features. So as a, as a rule, the features are always um, branched from alpha. The bugs are always branched and corrected from beta, from our beta candidate. And master is only hot fixes and only receives the the information from the beta channel. We never can merge from alpha into into master because it's a version that hasn't been stabilized and it's a version that hasn't been tested. Okay, Gradle. Um, as you probably know, it's a language based or a, a tool for automation based on the Groovy DSL language. It's similar to Maven and Ant in, uh, that uh, were working before in, in Java, but it's very specialized and it has been specifically designed for Android. It's, um, it's really powerful, al allows you to make a scripting, which is very important because sometimes, especially when it's a tool in development, you don't have all the functionality you want, but if you can script, you can like overcome and overgap those, those limitations and do exactly what you want. And testing, it's an entire discipline. We could be like talking uh, weeks about testing and all the different frameworks, what is a unit test, what is a user interface test, how we can combine them, integration test, etc. So we have a lot of, uh, of keywords. Are you familiar with all of them? Some of them new, Sp especially in Espresso, because that's a coffee, it's not a testing framework. I just missed it up and put an S and N. And um, yeah, as the last part of um, of the continuous integration, before I start showing you an example, um, there are a few websites to uh, or a few services that allow us to deliver our software. I particularly work with um, with uh, Hockey App, uh, with the Hockey Kit. It's, it's free and um, it has like a paid version, but the basic one you can use it uh, without paying. Since I'm not working with them, I want to offer a lot uh, of alternatives more. You have AppHands, AppBlade, Appalos, a beta builder. I've tried AppHands and I know it's good. Beta builder, I, I was using it before and I didn't like it that much, but that depends a lot on your requirements and uh, the necessities you have for your company. So now I would like to show you a few, uh, some examples on how to do it. I have prepared, I will upload everything later to um, uh, to Twitter, so you can download or check the, the code you want. Yeah, I have done a very, very small uh, program. I will open it here in Genymotion, which is this uh, Espresso project. So basically, the Espresso project has a has only a text view where we paint Hello World, right? And uh, it's this will be our project for for testing and integrating into into Jenkins. Uh, yeah, let's gonna see the main activity. Yeah, the main activity, as you see, is very very easy. So we have uh, pretty much just this uh, this uh, we said the content view of the layout, which only have a text view, a fragment, and nothing else. So we don't have any listener. However, we have a um, uh, we have a test. We know we always have always have to develop this. It's something that some people try to avoid. Maybe it's not that important. Maybe we accept the pressure of the managers or anything. That, that's some, uh, something that always hit us back. And I repeat it, it always hit us back. So the tests are a guarantee to avoid future problems. If we develop without test and the project gets complex, you will not be able to refactor. You will not be able to change anything. The cost per opportunity of developing a feature will explode. So it's if you haven't used test until now, I strongly recommend you to, when you get back, to get a book or get a um, um, tutorial and start learning about uh, Espresso your unit because it's definitely something that will uh, improve a lot your life. I have a um, um, couple of tests here. I'm going to comment one. 
these two first tests are, are working. So one of them check that uh, we have uh, the text view on the screen. The second one test that the text view has this test, uh, this um, the string hello world. And this false test, which is designed to fail, it check if the um, text view has uh, the text water level, which is obviously false. So I'm going to, just to show you an example, I'm going to release it. So it didn't take that much. So by the way, that here my Jenkins is failing. So I hope now it works. I try always to always to show some code and show some some real things on the presentations because if not, people get uh, I think they get bored boring. But now I, I hope I can. Yep. Which one? The terminal. The what do you mean the the console? Um, yeah. Well, that's not bigger. Okay. After the predex would go much faster. Yeah. What I want to what I want to prove you with this thing is that um, the. Um, when we are doing tests, and especially when we integrate into, into Jenkins, Jenkins will have a few jobs that are uh, trying to continuously build the application with its commit. Every time we're merging new branches, Jenkins will see, OK, there is something new. I'm going to download the code. I'm going to pack it. And I'm going to try to submit it to HockeyApp or to the whoever, the testers. or because that's, that's also makes life of everybody easier. Because the develop uh, the developer doesn't need to be like packaging anything and sending and manually doing anything. We need to trust the machines to do the work that is routinary, and that is uh, yeah. We can see here uh, is releasing lint. At some point, it will start to. It's very cool because it will um, yeah. If we have a, an emulator, we can see how the, the tests are being released here. And here we can see that the build and the test was successful. We can write a few HTMLs and a few XMLs. I'm not going to repeat it again because it takes some time. But uh, before, I tried to release the test. I think it's here. And it failed. I the comment, I uncomment this uh, method I saw you. And as you can see here, tells test false label. It failed because. Um, we were expecting the test water level, and there was a different test. So this is just a super basic example, but uh, you can get an idea of what you can try. You can try that a web service is downloading the the information you want that is fitting in your model, that given a a location for a, a to locate uh, something in a map is being located right with uh, yeah, whatever you want. The possibilities are are infinite. I'm gonna show you a little bit about uh, about Jenkins now, right? Just so you can get this uh, idea. I've been um, talking with you about the alpha branch. I've been talking about the beta branch, so we can see them here. This is a job for alpha. Let's going to see the, the setup. So basically, this job tries to get uh, information from a repository, which is in GitHub, from the branch develop, right? And it builds every time there is a new change pushed to GitHub. That means when we don't need to start it manually. Every time there is a new feature, we will try to download it and, uh, and construct it. And uh, we will call this command from here, gradle clean assemble alpha. So uh, that pretty much uh, cleans the, the, uh, the, all the information there and tries to build the application on the, on the alpha setup. Uh, we try to upload it later to Hockey App. I will show you now how it looks. We need an API token. Don't worry, because it's uh, been uh, recorded. It's my, an, an account I just made. And we try to upload this, uh, this file here. When is this uh, movie can, uh, well, we can have a lot of um, setups. For example, we can create a call, um, a job called alpha test to make all the tests in alpha to see that the application is, uh, is working. So we see that it has a different name, same repository. Uh, the same branch is uh, uh, taken from um, the from the develop branch, and here we see that we are calling to gradle clean connected check build, and um, well I changed the name here, but let me okay, and uh, if this is successful, we can for example tell the um, 
tell the job that uh, if you are able to, this is the command I just call on the console, if all the tests are successful and all, all the tests are working, please try to build the job Mobicom Alpha. This is, this is cool, because at first we are trying to download all the tests, we are trying to initialize, initialize them, to start them, and if the tests are failing, we don't do anything else. We can set up the job, for example, in these post build actions to, let's say, uh, if it's failing, um, send an email to uh, one person. Hey, the test just failed, take a look on the code. We can add the, the, the stack uh, trace, we can add lock cut, we can send uh, all the, the entire report. And um, yeah, if it's stable, if it's unstable, we have, as you see, a lot of possibilities. I normally have this first job, job to trigger all the UI tests and integration tests. If it's working, then I just start the entire change. And yeah, I work sometimes with libraries, so you can like combine everything. Like if the first test of the sub library are working, then I start with uh, with the main project that has all the UI. I keep in the library normally the, the HTTP clients and the things that are more abstract. Etc. And I saw you Hockey App, right? So um, I have like three different uh, products here in Hockey App. One is for um, alpha, for the alpha version. One is for beta, and another one is for the for the release. Let's see that here in alpha, I have like a few versions with uh, some name and version code and. Um, the cool thing with, with this thing is that this is the web version of Hockey App, right? But there is also a, a mobile app that I can install on my phone, and every time there is a new job that is being built, is passing all the tests that is being uploaded, I get a notification on my phone. I get a notification that says, hey, the, the last uh, version has been already uploaded, please check it out. You can uh, automatize Jenkins also to make like release notes automatically from the Git commits. That's why I mentioned maybe it's a good idea to write the, between brackets the Jira ticket. Because let's say we have a team of uh, testers. We want the testers to have access to the beta version and not to the alpha version. We can write on the commits this um, Jira ticket name all the time. So when we don't load the application, we don't have to be picking up the phone and telling them, yeah, we have the login, we have this fix, and we have this other one. They just can check it by themselves. So we can ensure that we as a programmer or as a developer are going to be developing and the testers are going to be testing and the product manager is going to be doing what they do, which I don't know what they do. But um, yeah, so now there are a few things that maybe I don't know if you realize. I was um, showing you a, a few things here, but um, yeah, for example, you see that there is like a number. Is this being done automatically? I, I mentioned a lot of things on, of automatization, but I haven't shown that much until now because that's part of Gradle. But we see these numbers, right? We see that there is like a different icon here. Why do we have a different icon? Can we make like a different package name? The answer is yes. So I'm going to show you a little bit on, on Gradle, on a few tricks that you can apply to, uh, to let's say, automatize a little bit more the uh, how things are done. It's okay, the size, or? Guys, at the, at the end? Okay. Okay, for example, we want to keep the version in automatically. We, want the, we don't want to increase the version code and the version name automatically. That's boring. We make mistakes. Then, hey, my application is not installing because the version code is smaller than the other one. Let's going to do this automatically. This is a suggestion. You can probably find more. This is uh, one of the ways I, I work. We can have uh, this, for example, three fields here. One is the, the major version, there is a minor version, and there is a bug fix. This is according to the model I showed you. One week for stabilization, one week for development, and they are like overlapping. Then um, when we are going to calculate this version code and this version name, instead of having an, uh, a static value here, I have these two functions, compute version code and compute version name. How I compute the version code? I just take the major, I multiply it per uh, 10,000, the minor 10, 000, uh, per 1,000, and then to get the build number, what I do is to get the uh, build number of the, uh, of the computer I'm building the application in, and if not, I, does, I use this integer, the 9999. If you get the idea, uh, in our Jenkins server, we will have a environment variable called build number. We can make like Android build number or our product build number. And um, every time we try to build the application, we will take this value. We have seen all the post actions we can use in Jenkins. One of the post actions could be to increase this number in one. 
So we make sure that every time the application is being built, Jenkins will take the current value of build number, will use it as the version number from this for this application, and will increase it in one. What is the benefit of this? We can be working like three, four people in an application, and when we are committing, we ensure that each of our uh, of of each version that is being commit, like pretty much every commit, will have a unique number. There will never be a conflict. There will never be a problem because we have the, already the same version code and we cannot install, etc. Another uh, thing I was using for some time also was just to counter the number of commits. For example, you just can take the number of commits, count them, and use them as a build number. But a problem I had with this thing is that uh, sometimes to me, it happened once that we had a serious problem. We need to reset into a version that was like 20 commits before, and we fucked up the entire system. Because the, the new versions were like 20 numbers after. We had to manually change this build number to make everything work again. But this version ensures that even if you have to reset and check out uh, hard from the, from the git, you will still keep on building. Which more things can we do? Um, how many people here is familiar with the build config field of Android? OK, not that many. OK, build config is great. Um, we can establish different build types to, uh, for Android. In, uh, initially, we only have debug and release, right? Because that's what uh, it came by default. Debug is when we're clicking, and uh, we use this debug key, and uh, it's nothing special, the thing we do in our computer. And release is the important one. It's the one when we apply pro etc. et cetera. But we can define as many as we want. We can have, for example, an alpha version. We can have a beta version. We can see that um, there are like difference. If, for example, we are using uh, Google Analytics, we don't want to use the key of Google Analytics of production in testing because we are misleading the people. It's, uh, you know, if we have like a, a user interface test and this test is open, it's using a key, but then, okay, I'm, I'm testing like thousand times a day, uh, then this is gonna be like a real false thing in the, in the Google Analytics dashboard when I check it. So we can uh, create fields. We can see here, for example, uh, regarding the Google Analytics. Google uh, build config field as a string will be called GA uh, API key, and we'll have this identifier. One for alpha, another one for beta, and for release, like a very special one. We can also use this for uh, using domains when we are developing very likely. Our alpha version is uh, using uh, development.ourdomain.com, the release version, 3w.ourdomain.com, etc. We can also do it from here. Let's see that release has a variable called environment, which is domain.com. In beta, it's also called the staging sometimes, right? So we have the staging version, development version in uh, alpha, demo version in the back. There are a lot of possibilities. I also do a lot. You've seen that there are like three, I have like these three versions in in hockey app, right? With the uh, alphabet and without any special things. I like to do it a lot, because I like to have on my phone the, all the versions at the same time, because sometimes you something breaks, breaks and you don't know exactly where it happened. You don't know, is this something that is happening because I'm calling the production server and I'm getting a different call and you just want to check it fast from your phone. So I want to have all the applications at the same time. Which problem do you have in Android? The package name. If it's the same, it will overwrite. So you cannot keep all the versions. How I, do I solve this problem? I use this application ID suffix and version name suffix. So when I'm building with a different build type, I change the package name. That means I can have the beta version, the alpha version, and the release version at the same time in my phone and check all of them. And when I go to Hockey App, I can just select one of them, install it again, and check it out. Another question that you're maybe thinking, like how do we use these different icons? That's a super easy uh, example. If we uh, came here to our source folder, we see that we have, uh, uh, yeah, you, you're probably familiar with main, that's where we store our, all our code, right? You're probably familiar with the Android test, where we store all our tests. But now I have two more, alpha and beta. So it's as easy as this, I can create a new folder called alpha, called beta, called the name of my build type, and I can just put like different images, different resources, I can use different strings, uh, strings. I can even use like different manifests, different uh, source files like Java and stuff. This is in alpha, for example. 
and if I came here to beta, and I open this one, I see that the, there is a, the, the beta title there. So uh, it's a super flexible system. You just can create one that has exactly the same name as your build type. And uh, Gradle, when it's packaging, will go automatically to this dialog um, folder and try to get the content that, that is there. OK. I think that's uh, pretty much everything. I think I'm not forgetting many things. Yeah, well, you, you know, like the, the release, uh, the sending configs, uh, those are done by default. So you just can uh, select different um, um, key stores to sign your application. I haven't showed you the, the build config, but maybe we can, I can show you very fast. So if um, I was talking, for example, about the domain, right, or the or the Gi Analytics API key. You see this thing here, so string Gi aim. So with this code like this, I will just get the Google Analytics that uh, correspond to the build type. I don't have to make any ugly thing or any boilerplate, like if environment is developed, then do this, then don't do this. I just call this, and it's automatically done. And yeah, just very fast, I would like to show you in GitHub uh, one, um, one, this project is commit to hit, uh, GitHub. I will show you, I will say, um, upload it later to Twitter so you can check it out. But I just want to show you a few, a very fast example on how uh, I do the pull request. And this should be called, how is this called? Yeah. OK, um, about the branches. We have the master branch, right? Uh, we have uh, states and develop. As I said, this can be alpha and beta, depending on how you want to work. I have a bug branch. I have a feature branch. And when I want to, to merge them, we have this tool here called pull request. So for example, I will have a, I have fixed a bug, right? So I want to uh, merge this bug one yeah, into states, which is the, the, the beta branch, the one in the middle. And here, I, I pretty much make the make this pull request. So this is a colleague of mine, Nick. Uh, he wrote, fix that nagging bug. So I just can come here. I can see the commit. I can see the file that was changed. So this is just an example. He changed just only one line. But I could, for example, if um, what, what is very good about the, the pull request is that you can really like make as many comments as you want. You can like have a lot of philosophical discussions like, is this like a void value or a null value? But null maybe has something, so we should make an object that doesn't have any content. You can like discuss everything. Like I could write a note here, like uh, I think uh, you should not use an empty space, for example. Or then he can comment. We can have like a discussion. And uh, no, I think it's better because this makes the code much better. We follow the uh, guidelines and everything. When everybody agrees, you can just. Um, I normally write like a, a thumb up in the comments, and then we just can proceed to uh, click here on uh, merge pull request, and then it's merged into the, the branch. I have this one uh, for a feature, right? Uh, it's instead of merging into staging, it's merging into develop. And we can see the same. Like There has been a few features that has been changed, so you just write, make your comments. In this one, for example, I have uncommented or commented the, the f test that was failing. And yeah, it's a, a very nice way to work and, and make sure that the quality of the code goes super up. So I think that's now pretty much everything, if my presentation wants to open. OK. It has been breaking all the time, this preview. OK. Yeah. There are a lot of books. I also have my own one, wrote it recently. So if you want to check it out, it's 100 questions and, an and answers to um, help you land your dream Android job. Uh, with this code, you can get 50% of discount in, in Amazon. You can access it from this website. I cannot put more, because there is like a cost of production. But yeah, if you need the PDF uh, uh, version, just let me know, and I can also mail it to you. That's not a problem at all. So yeah, I think this is uh, everything. It's been a lot of uh, things together and a lot of information, but I hope you enjoyed it as much as I um, enjoyed talking about that. This is, again, my Google Plus and my Twitter. If you want to follow it, ask me any question later. I, I'm, I read more than I write in Twitter, but yeah, from time to time, I write some articles or publish some code and, and normally let it know through there. So. 
if there is any question or any topic you want to discuss a little bit further. So do you have any questions? We have a book for the best one. Um, how do you manage the alignment between application and server APIs? Yeah, that's, uh, I call it integration test. So it's, um, when I work, I, I normally keep all, all those, um, I keep a library to, to make the, uh, the server connections. And in this library, I have all the HTTP clients. Uh, when, I'm, uh, when I'm testing the application, I'm normally mocking it, right? If, for example, let's say I want to download a list of items and I want to display them in, a, in the profile, I mock this. That means I give you a JSON and a standard one because I don't want to be like uh, uh, requesting the, the, uh, the server all the time. But for testing, I keep this special library. This library is tested when it's being updated, which doesn't happen that often. And it's pretty much a class with retrofit that uh, performs all the all the requests to the server and just checks that the the information is fitting into the model. But since it's uh, since you want to test a lot and you don't want to stress the without any need the server, I keep it in a different project. And uh, when there is an update for the models, which doesn't really happen that that often or through the to the HTTP classes, that's when I release it. And uh, yeah, pretty much gets the information, check that it's fitting into the model, or JSON, or if you have any JSON converter or XML converter, see that uh, that's working. Which is also good, because sometimes you can see if there is any problem on the on the server. I remember a few times that uh, I was working with my team, we finished something, it was like kind of working, so we make the entire process of uh, constructing all the applications, and then on, on master we get an error, like this cannot happen, the application has been tested and, and it's working. And the problem is that in, in the production server, there was some weird data, like I think uh, the date, the date, the, the day was, came, was not coming in the ISO format, but was like coming a null value or something like that, and it was not fitting. And then we saw the test and took the phone and called the guys like, hey, you know this is re uh, sending the bad information? Oh, fuck, man, this is in production, blah, blah, blah. And, So it's a question about uh, the versioning. And uh, do you guys always uh, bump the version number up each time you build? Yeah. Uh, so it can be like ridiculously high if you have a lot of commits? Yeah, it's uh, the version, the, the real version, like one, two, three, the, the first digit is, uh, is, is normally like low, let's say, like not maximum than five, because this is also like a new world, so you normally don't have, say, mobile has like five or six years. But yeah, the, the second two numbers can get really high, especially the last one. So the, the last number, I, I think in some cases, is over 1,000. Okay, so do you go to when you go to production and to release, you, you don't ever uh, you know, cut down the last number? or like Actually, yes. Yeah, in the production version, I take it out, because it's not relevant for the user. Mm. So I, I keep it like internally. When, I'm, when we are working with uh, alpha or beta versions, we keep it. And it's also good because when you get a, a lock at uh, a problem or an exception, if we use uh, Crasalytics, for example, that ins it sends you exactly this code. But in the uh, final version, the one that, that is being delivered to the user, I just remove it because it's not relevant for them. And that also means like because you have the release version and you also have the app version yeah. number. And the app version number always has to be one higher or do you actually increase that as well for every commit? No, for the for the user there is like a standard one. So this uh, this versioning, I keep it as or is how I like to do it. I keep it internal because it's something for the developers. It's not something for the user. The user will have this okay. two, three, uh, two, okay. four. Okay. So uh, they, they don't really need to know if which back version or which. Uh, Thanks. Someone else. Okay, so who's going now? I like the first one, yeah, because I, I think it's uh, many people confuse integration with uh, should be done like on the yeah. Okay, so count on me to take the book. Thank you for your presentation, then see you in twenty-five minutes.